All right. Well, just to finish that series of introductions, uh, I grew up in Austria, came to the US uh, in 96 and joined the WCA shortly thereafter. I think I've been a member for close to 20 years by now. But the only event I ever attended was one of the February meetings in Toronto. Has just not yet happened that I would uh, go for go on a trip with any one of you. Uh, but yeah, today I want to make experiences on the Philon. And initially thought I would pack two Philon trips into one talk and then realize this is getting too long. So today I'm showing you, telling you stories from the 2002 trip and a week from today about the guided trip uh, 2019. Uh, uh, <laughs> very briefly to understand the 2002 trip, I need to tell a few sentences about what I did in 2001. I was participating in a kayak race down the Mississippi where the pre-race dinner uh, talked to two racers from one of the competitive teams, Team Alaska, said, well, next year we want to paddle the field on, not as a race, just as a fun event. Now, one of them was a wildlife biologist. The other one was an anthropologist and his youth had wrote, written, done some research on the Inuit community in Baker Lake and now just wanted to visit them as a friend. And I thought this sounds damned interesting. Well, four weeks later, after 2,300 miles downstream in Mississippi in a bar in New Orleans, a third member of Team Alaska, Will Miles, invited me, why don't you join us on the field on next year? Too good to say no. I knew nothing about with whom I'm signing up here. They didn't know me. All I knew about them, there's only one real rapid on the Mississippi, I would say. <laughs> they managed to capsize there, realized they couldn't really get into the boat and the boat pumped out again because they're floating towards a dam. So they decided to swim to shore, put in a kayak and continue the race. And I thought, hey, those are cool problem solvers. I can travel with those guys. So they invited me to join them on the field on. The plan originally was yeah, to start at the headwaters, Lynx Lake, follow the whole river down through the field on game preserve, showing here in green to Beverly Lake, Aberdeen Lake, Schultz Lake, to the town of Baker Lake. And so I originally thought this is a group of five or so. They invited me to join a uh, whole length of the river, depending which book or source you believe that's 550 miles, that would be 880 kilometers or 950 by some sources. Um, but yeah, I work a full-time job as a research chemist in drug discovery. I technically have three weeks of vacation a year ahead at that time. I had just done a four week trip the year before with a little bit of massaging a few personal days while well, I can get another four week trip in, but not much extra. So sorry, forget about the shakedown trip, uh, forget about too much present preparation. I was at work until 7.30 or so on July the 3rd, packed on the 4th, flew to Yellowknife on the 5th with the plan to fly out on the 7th. So not, not too much room here, but we thought, well, it's an ambitious schedule, but overall, the daily mileage we need to paddle is less than a quarter of what we did the year before in the Mississippi. That's, we hope we can do it. We're also hoping that kayaks would turn out to be a little bit faster on the river trip than canoes. I want to question that by now. But uh, anyway, this was the plan. <laughs> Happened that uh, all the other guys dropped out. In the end, it was Will who pushed me, hey, buy a ticket, let's make this firm, let's go. But yeah, it would be only the two of us, which again, okay, why not? Uh, we'll be an adventure, let's do it. Um, it was only relatively close to the trip when I had the chance to look through a little bit more of the trip descriptions that I had and started to worry a little bit. Did, did we bite off too much here? Will that be too ambitious? But uh, we'll see. Anyway, 
Let me just introduce you to both of us here on the left is Will, on the right is me. And as you might guess, the pictures are from the end of the trip. That's a funny beard on both of us, but I didn't have good shots from early in the trip. Um, good book about the feel under the one to, that, I, that I read that was very useful for descriptions, including details about the rapids, uh, is Three Seasons in the Wind from Kathleen and Michael Pitt. But yeah, when I read it, I realized, you know, it took them 37 days. Now they might not pushed, might not have pushed that hard. Um, but yeah, we got a little concerned, to be honest. So getting to Yellowknife, talking to the outfit or there, also convinced us, well, maybe that the dinner is a little ambitious. We decided to fly to Jim Lake instead, skip the first 80 or so kilometers in a few rapids. Now, can you point out where you put in? Right. Uh, at Jim Lake here. Jim Lake, can, okay. Can you see the That's cursor? It. Thank you. The other thing that we did discuss with the outfitter was that the further we can fly would be right from the band flown back to Yellowknife. Uh, <laughs> we had planned to fly out on the 7th, had reserved a beaver um, to fly us out while well, the 7th, the weather was bad. And then on the 8th, it turned out there is no beaver. There's no twin engine plane. Uh, Will and I are not 100% sure what the story was. Does Tom Fess, Tundra Tom, did he actually not have a beaver available? Or I think I remember him saying that's a gas guzzler and can't fly that far. The Cessna goes further. But it's a lot smaller plane. And this is just my gear. The pilot plus two big guys plus the gear for both of us for four weeks fits into that plane. So, oh well, it's just money, fly twice. Want to point out this big bag here, uh, around 80 pounds or so, but it's a folding kayak, a skin on frame kayak. Uh, relatively convenient. I mean, the airlines charge a little bit extra, but I had no problem bringing that from Connecticut on Air Canada all the way to Yellowknife. Will and I, I don't remember did we draw sticks or what made me go first, but they dropped me off on Jim at Jim Lake. And then the bush plane and the pilot left. I realized, okay, I might be the only human within a hundred miles here. And I found a bunch of wolf prints around my tent spot. Okay, this is wilderness, now I'm out here. Uh, but that's what I came for. And previous picture, I had shown you the boat in a bag. Here now is the wooden frame assembled. I don't know whether you're familiar with uh, this type of skin on frame kayaks. And then you push this frame into a PVC hull that then has relatively small sponsons that get inflated to tighten the hull and give a little bit of extra buoyancy in case the cockpit totally floods. Uh, Nice boat, fast boat, flexes a little bit, is relatively stable. But the pain in the rear end to load and unload. You need to open that zipper in the back deck and have a lot of small bags in there. Which isn't quite ideal, but in the end you close this up. And this is how the full fully assembled loaded boat looks like. I found that carry Wentler there, but no, I did not take that with me. That did not ride on top of the boat. Uh, this is Will Miles who was paddling a Klepper Arius II. So the, the pouch that I had uh, is an East German boat. So there it was pronounced Puch. Uh, Will's Klepper is a West German brand. I'm giving away my age here from before the German unification. Uh, <laughs> originally designed as a tandem boat. And I think he had planned to use it with one of the other guys that then ended up dropping out. 
but it worked pretty good to transport all the gear that I couldn't fit all my stuff into my boat. So we put this into 82nd seat was worked fine, but it was significantly harder work to paddle that boat alone. So we, we took turns most of the time, Will was paddling it, but a few days I helped him out with that. Uh, but one detailed consequence of that, paddling that tandem boat solo, there was no spray skirt that would have completely sealed, sealed off the cockpit. So the thought that uh, we aren't as wave sensitive as canoes would be, because we're better sealed in, uh, didn't really stand up to reality. To what is the uh, water temperature like? Uh, that year I didn't measure. When I was back out in the field on in 2019, two weeks early, it was around five Celsius Fahrenheit. I think it was a little warmer in July then, but 10 degrees. So you, you don't really want to go for a swim if you can help it. I mean, we did dive in once or twice to wash off, but uh, you don't want to caps. I had brought my dry suit, but soon realized A, Will doesn't have one. And B, if the conditions are that rough that I need it, I shouldn't be paddling anyway. We can't afford losing some gear, losing or damaging a boat. So that was the one piece of gear that next time I wouldn't bring or I didn't bring on the second trip. The feeling up there, flowing river, uh, we had hoped for more current. I had a GPS with me. I remember once excitingly writing down, we had a seven mile an hour current for a stretch, but most of the time it's a barren land river, meaning it's flowing through a lake with almost no current and you have a rapid to portage around and then it is the next lake with almost no current which made us a little slower than we expected. And let me mention one more detail about the kayak. Since Will's boat was so much easier to load, just put all these bags in where the second person would sit. And maybe he's just faster in the morning, but then his boat is slower to paddle. So occasionally he pushed off early while I was finishing packing. Uh, and I would start 20, 30 minutes after him, paddling hard, trying to catch up. <laughs> Which is all fine until I started thinking, what if there is an island? I pass the island on one side while he's on the other side. I keep pushing as hard as I can, thinking he's still ahead of me, while he's paddling slow, thinking he's waiting for me to catch up. Didn't happen, but in hindsight, that was... It was the one, one of the few things that made me worried on this trip. You get that on braided rivers also. We really always try to follow the same line because somebody could be, you know, 10 meters to the right of you on a different braid and they disappear behind an island. Yeah. And it's exactly what happens. And it, these could be kilometers because it widens and comes back together. So you really honestly have to stay together. You get into yeah. I, I have no regrets, but it's not the recommendation that you should do it the exact same way. <laughs> Kurt, uh, yeah, other than that, one communication back to uh, Yellowknife. We had one satellite phone with us, yes. One sat phone, okay. So whenever we were separated, we we had no means to communicate with each other, but we could call, call back Yellowknife. Or we did maybe fourth day or so call either his wife or my girlfriend or my parents to just give the outside world an update. We are still alive. Um, landscape there is barren lands. We are technically north of tree line, but in the Filon Valley, there are these occasional patches of trees. It's not, not totally free of trees yet. Uh, you have the river valley and above, once you get out of that, it's very, very flat. Uh, I love this landscape, this 
freedom of no fences and no no trespassing signs. And lots of big sandy beaches in the upper stretches of the Filon. Um, there is some fishing. Uh, I caught my first lake trout within less than five minutes of the first time I ever tried to do what maybe you can call fly fishing, maybe not even. Uh, but to be honest, Will and I agreed on almost everything, but not so much on how to cook a fish. Uh, and we had so much food that we brought and the long portage coming that we decided, let's just eat what we have. We, we had that one fish, but then didn't tell you how good the fishing is along the way. Can't tell you whether you can reliably leave food at home and rely on fishing. Uh, by the way, all those that were talking about going to the Philon, if you want more details like the coordinates of our campsites and stuff like that, recommended camp spots, which rapid to run left or right, uh, email me afterwards. Uh, Third or fourth day, I think, Iberry Lake was our first. Uh, that gave us the first feeling of, well, when the wind picks up, the waves can get a little challenging. Having those waves from the side for a few miles was a little bit of a nuisance, but not that big a deal. And on our, during our lunch stop, that little gooseling might have decided Will looks like his mother, uh, got imprinted on it, whatever, we held it for a few minutes and then left it behind as an orphan. Sorry, <laughs> but I take that as an intro to talk a little bit about the wildlife that we saw along the trip. But the hope was we would in intersect the porcupine caribou herd. But uh, no, we did not. The caribou here, two or three there, probably a total of two dozen during the trip. Um, yeah, but not, not the dark scenery of having a whole herd crossing the river in front of us that we had dreamed of. Um, since the 1970s or 80s, there are moose up in the Filon area. They're expanding northwards. And I would say we saw roughly the same number of moose as caribou on the trip, uh, two to three dozen. That picture, by the way, was taken in the middle of the night. We were two weeks after summer solstice and just a little bit short, short of the Arctic Circle. So the sun did disappear below the horizon, but never got really totally dark. Uh, and that one day we had three moose walk right through camp, uh, walked into the water there and stood there for an hour. Occasionally, the head going underwater, maybe to feed on water plants, maybe to just get the waves on the mosquitoes. But they were not very concerned about us at all. Probably saw three dozen or so musk oxen during the trip, uh, one herd of 10 or so, and otherwise individuals. And I have two little stories to tell. So one of those days, the river is floating really gentle low current, no rapid anywhere near. There's a musk ox ahead on the shore. I pull out my SLR camera with the 70 to 300 zoom. Picture, adjust, take another picture, adjust, take another picture. Realize I need to zoom out a little bit to get the whole musk ox on the pic into the frame, take another picture. Need to zoom out even more to get that animal onto the screen. And suddenly my kayak stops because the current had washed me up on the shore. Yeah, maybe 20 meters from the animal. <laughs> Tried to knuckle walk as quick as I can the boat back into the floating water, but fortunately musk oxen just ignored me. <laughs> and one day we pulled into what we thought was a nice campsite, flat gravel patch with some bushes next to it. Yeah, this looks decent. Suddenly in that bush or tall grass, the musk oxen stands up, snorted us. He was taking his nap there and wasn't so happy about getting disturbed. So, okay, buddy. 
this is your side. Uh, Arctic ground squirrels, the base of the food chain there. Although there were not as many there, it's on the Horton trip. Uh, that was 97. I did the down the lower part of the Horton. I never did the canyon. Uh, so a few Arctic here. Uh, those animals are so much bigger than I thought they would be. But okay, maybe to the wildlife that you're more interested in. We never saw a bear. Good amount of bear footprints. Some bears cat every now and then. Uh, took this one picture of a bear footprint. Uh, the sandal is a relatively big foot. Like, can't really tell. Maybe either one of you knows this. For a grizzly, is that big? I would say no. Okay. Definitely no. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> uh, got the better view of the bear in the, the second trip, the 2019 trip, partially because we brought the telescope on that one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, no bears on this trip, which is just fine. We, by the way, we had brought bear spray and some flares and a signal horn and we did not carry a gun. Uh, I think we twice on the trip saw a wolf, but always just quick glimpses before the animal disappeared into the woods. So this, I think they were wolves. I wouldn't bet the house on it. Story about wolves. One day I walk away from the tent in the evening, looking for a nice rock to lean on to <laughs> take a dump <laughs> while I'm crouched down there. I realize, oh, I'm just, Taking a dump here on top of Wolf's cat. Didn't think much about it originally, but then figured out, oh, wait a moment, wolves mark their territory that way. The next morning, my stuff was smeared apart. I think the wolves were there overnight again, but we didn't hear or see them. Other than that, on that trip, we saw one Arctic fox that uh, just had its, claw, its jaws around the neck of a goose. And we saw on the whole trip, only two humans. And sorry, ladies, that were just taking a swim in the river to wash off when we came around the corner. Sorry to disturb your bath, but hi. <laughs> and the other kind of wildlife. Yeah, the bugs are bad there. Having done a few Arctic rivers, yeah, the bugs are bad in the Freeland area. It probably means something that the Inuit didn't want to live there in the summer. They came to hunt from Baker Lake, but they considered, supposedly they considered it too buggy. This was a day when I made coffee and oatmeal or cereal at the same time and then realized holding both in my hands, I can't eat. Did. So I put the cereal down on the ground for a few minutes and got a little extra protein. Uh, but with, with mosquito netting, bug netting, and beet, it's doable. I, I still enjoyed it. And my family, after seeing all the pictures of this trip with this and more mosquito pictures, still came along with me in 2019. So don't let that scare you off. Um, back from the wildlife to the river, Barrenlands ri River, Canadi Canadian Shield, you have these occasional ledges that run across the river. Uh, good amount of scouting, but most of them are runnable on the Philon. Every now and then you have this problem, you hope it's runnable because the portage would mean pull out quite a bit earlier and go over, or in this case, ferry to the other side. Uh, one more of those, two more of those ledges running across the whole river. Uh, some of those we lined or made be able to float in real sh shallow water and go right along the edge. Um, overall, 
not too much white, white water. Uh, but I think I have already mentioned things that are runnable in the south when you are an hour from your car are not necessarily runnable when you are three weeks travel from civilization. You need to be a little bit more careful. Will in front, standing in front of those that I think we lined. And then roughly a week into the trip, there is the canyon of the Filon, which starts with a two meter or so waterfall and then has five kilometer of river with some rapids and cliffs on both sides. So no, these rapids in there would most likely be not runnable and you certainly can't risk realizing that they're not runnable when you're here and have to try to climb up the cliff with the boat. So it's a five kilometer portage, still relatively early on in the trip. And Will, thank you, you are a wonderful camp cook. Thanks for all the great food that you made. But during that portage, I hated the fact that we have four cans of asparagus and a lot of other canned fresh fruit. Uh, and kayaks, portage a lot less comfortable than canoes do. Uh, we carried one boat, both of us together with a few light items in it and headed back for the second boat and then the gear, which again, the gear big in many small bags that you stuff into the corners of the kayak, the big blue barrels that we all love on our canoe trips. Um, so those five kilometers took us two days. And they might have been among the hardest physical labor days that I had. Whoever said portaging across the open tundra is easy, I respectfully disagree with that. Uh, there's a whole series of small little creeks running into the Filon, which cut in quite a bit. So when you're up there along the edge, you either take a few hundred yard detour inland or you go down into that little narrow creek and back up on the other side. And those are totally filled with vegetation. So it was bushwhacking while balancing a kayak overhead. On the other hand, it's really beautiful landscape. I love it up there and I would go back anytime. At uh, some point during that portage, Will sprained his ankle, fortunately. That was the only injury in the whole trip and turned out not to be too bad. Uh, and at some point, we dropped my kayak on the side, uh, broke this wooden piece that was part of a loop here that uh, normally it was supposed to interlock with this piece to hold the frame together and then the skin goes over it. But a 20 centimeter piece of, an, of a spruce tree plus some duct tape and we are fine to go again. And after the trip, I still have that piece of spruce in there. Never bought it to get the original replacement trip, a replacement piece, the trip that stayed in the kayak until now. Uh, so after five kilometer and I think Part of it, we did five walks. Part of it, we might have done in four walks. Uh, we came to the confluence of the Clark and the Filon. And technically, I think we put in into the Clark 100 yards from the confluence with the Filon because it was the easier access there. Uh, but from there on, the river is wide again with not too many rapids. Uh, beautiful paddling. Now, there's one rapid right downstream from that confluence here, which will be its own story in the next trip, the 2019 trip when we got here and it was really foggy and I knew there's a rapid coming. Uh, just upstream of the confluence of the Hanbury and the, and the Filon, uh, one last significant rapid. And 
I think I remember we both paddled it on the river left. But then there is Will ahead of me on the right side. So maybe he ran that on the right and I did on the left. Maybe we were both on the right. I do remember we scouted that, decided it's a big haystack, but if we can keep the kayak straight, go over it, we might have some water splash over it, but we can do it because again, to get over this cliff and around this cliff would mean pull out a quarter mile upstream and some significant effort. So there was an incentive to run this. You know, there was no way to walk along the edge. I got a good amount of water splashing on my chest. Fortunately, okay, if you lean forward enough, it doesn't rip you out of the cockpit, all good. Kept the boat straight, popped over it and was in calm water downstream, all good. And we kept going. A uh, little further downstream, we came to uh, the leftover of a warden's cabin that uh, there was a game warden in the area for, I believe, two years, 1928, 29, to watch out over uh, prevent poaching. But I think after those two years, they realized it's not worth to keep a person there. There isn't enough people coming through. And at that point, 2002, the roof of the cabin was still intact. There was a logbook in the cabin that we signed in. And if I remember right, I think we realized there's one group ahead of us on the river. Uh, 2019, when I came back, the roof was caved in. Uh, the other thing that we found there was a sign by, uh, seemed to have been carved by Edgar Hornby, who with two other men, according to some sources, uh, supposedly his nephews, headed out in 1926 to this area, wanting to intercept the caribou herd, hunt caribou, uh, make meat caches for the winter and spend the winter out there. Unfortunately, they missed the caribou herd. And Looks like John made it until 11th of April or maybe a few days longer, but no, sorry, none of them survived. Uh, How bad were the bugs, Kurt? Sorry, say that again, please. How bad were the bugs? Uh, I would say two thirds of the pictures I'm wearing the bug net. They are two thirds of the day I had the bug net on. Uh, there are a few pictures of mine that showed the that little bit of skin that you have exposed between your gloves and and the bug jacket is all bitten up or between the socks and the pants. Um, but I remember early on in the trip, Will told looked at my bottle of DEET at 30% and said nobody in Alaska buys stuff under 95%. You definitely they need bug nets, you definitely need DEET, but with that, it's okay. And the 2019 trip, we started two weeks earlier and had mosquitoes, but very, very little black flies. We were earlier in the season, at times they were bad. We did travel with uh, two boats, as I mentioned before, and two tents, which sometimes we used one tent to cook and eat if the bugs were bad. And then, okay, we don't want to sleep in that tent because of the bears. But after airing out the tent for a day, every now and then it was, uh, you know, it's nice to have each have our own place to sleep. Will and I <laughs> stayed great friends during the trip and stayed great friends afterwards. He's a, having a chance to occasionally retreat into your own tent is certainly not a bad thing. But yes, it adds to the amount of gear that you need to haul or need to pay the push plane for. Further downstream, at some point, there is a broken canoe embedded in a sandbank that has been there long enough that it's mentioned in the guidebook. We do not know whether that group abandoned it there or further upstream and it got washed down here, what happened to those people. But other than many beautiful river miles and wildlife, there aren't too many remarkable points, so the canoe is used as a mile marker. <laughs> uh, 
One other spot we passed is the cabin of the Canadian Hydrological Survey, which seems to be a pickup spot for many people by float plane because there's a ton of leftover. So either the survey stocks it really well for their staff that goes out there, but to us, it looked like that's leftover from uh, groups that fly back and don't want to take their leftover food with them and leave it there. And at that point, we thought it's interesting. A week later, we thought about that food differently, but I'll get to that. Yeah, at that point, the river is gentle flowing, sandy islands. We're getting close to Beverly Lake. Uh, so in total, all the way to get here for the statistics, Sorry, I'll get, get to the statistics later. Let's keep talking about paddling. Uh, on the 25th, we got here to Hori Point. Uh, spent some time at the Mounties Station in Baker Lake trying to convince a local from there to run his motorboat upstream. The river is runnable by motorboat all the way to here to pick us up because it could be quite a lot cheaper. And yeah, two more sightsee two more days of sightseeing on a long boat ride. But uh, that didn't work out. So, uh, yeah. Oops, I had, sorry. <laughs> had gotten ahead of me a little bit before. So roughly halfway through the trip, we realized, you know, the mileage that we are doing, it would be a challenge to get to Baker Lake on time. Um, if I paddled the double boat, we were a little bit faster, but Will liked his boat better. I liked mine better. You know what, let's just make Hori Point our goal and not battle what might be big waves on the big lakes, uh, Beverly Lake, Aberdeen Lake, and Schultz Lake, and stop here. So, tried to organize a motorboat ride. That didn't happen. So, we called back to Yellowknife and were told, yeah, I uh, can pick you up maybe on the afternoon of the 27th, but weather dependent, but paddle over into this bay here. This is more wave protected, independent of which direction the wind is coming from. Okay. So we spent the day here, and I think in the morning of the 27th, we were told, hey guys, I might be able to pick you up this evening. So, okay, we need to get over there. Unfortunately, that was a day with significant wind from the northeast, so coming from here. So while we were behind this sandbar, it was all fine. But then it got a little choppy. Uh, and that wasn't the worst because when it, got bad, when it got bad, I put the camera away. And as I mentioned before, Will is essentially paddling an open cockpit. So yeah. Wasn't ideal, but we made it. Uh, we made it over to here. And Will said, I have enough of this. I don't want to push another mile into the headwind. I'll carry my gear across. And I said, fine for you, but I have enough of portaging. I paddle around. And the time it took me to paddle around, Will had carried all his gear across. And then we paddled the empty clapper. Now together as a tandem with two paddlers around rather than carrying it. Which made me realize the two seats in a clapper are really close together. It's great if you have the same really need to keep the same cadence, even if it's not your natural cadence. Uh, which you should anyway, but that boat is not forgiving for this at all. So we got around here on the 27th. And then we're told, well, alternatingly, the next day is the weather was either bad in Yellowknife or was bad in Whitefish Lake, where the plane needed to stop for refueling, or was bad here, or the outfitter was concerned it might be bad on any of those spots. So we were sitting out there for another six days. Fortunately, yeah, previous groups had left behind a canoe that worked nice as a windbreaker, had left behind the chair. Will had brought a chess set. We had a few days of extra food anyway, although towards the end, 
we were out of control and started to think, hey, that cabin of the hydrological survey is roughly 30 kilometer upstream. We might have to go, go back there and retrieve some food. But we every day were told, next day, I think I can pick you up. Next day, I think I can pick you up. So uh, we have another day of food. We'll just wait. This sign, that's one thing about this country. It's a great place for waiting. That picture is from the office of our outfitter. So maybe this should have been a warning sign that nobody tries to keep a set schedule. Might have been Tom, the pilot's mantra. But I don't really want to blame them for it. It might have really been that the weather in Yellowknife was bad. Or I also understand that when he's three or four days behind schedule, because of the weather, there might be other people who need to be flown out first. At one point, he told us on the phone, you two guys are from Alaska. You know how to survive out there for a few more days. Me being from Austria and now living in Connecticut, I took this as a promotion. <laughs> but yeah, finally, uh, August 2nd, we got picked up after almost getting missed because the pilot had written, we had given them a GPS coordinates of our campsite but the pilot left that piece of paper back in the office and was too embarrassed to call back the office. He thought he would find us and almost didn't. But all well that ends well, picked us up there in the late afternoon of the third, second, flew us back to Whitefish Camp as an easy entry into civilization again. And on the fourth, sorry, the third, back to Yellowknife. Settled 15 days to cover around 530 kilometer, around 35 kilometer a day. One day that we were really windbound, plus uh, seven that we sat around waiting. Uh, um, yep. And if you hold it, give me one or two more minutes. Uh, I had said in the announcement, give a little bit of a comparison, canoe versus kayak. I have by now done a few river trips in canoes, few sea kayaking trips along the ocean, along the coast in kayaks, and this one river trip in a kayak. I personally still find kayaks more maneuverable and feel more comfortable in rough water with a double blade. But that might just be a canoe. Uh, I am faster solo in a kayak than solo in a canoe. But I think a well coordinated team to get in a two person canoe probably proves me wrong. Uh, we needed more or less to the skin on frame boats uh, to be able to fold them up and take them into the air into airplanes to make this trip doable. But if you have the option, especially if your trips include any portages, canoes are so much easier to portage, easier to load and unload every day. And you sit more or kneel more comfortable in the canoe than the kayak. So for my next trip, if I have the choice, I vote for canoe. And this was all I had about the 2002 trip. And next week for guys trip, in 2019, I took the family on a guided trip with an outfitter, and we'll talk about that in a week. Great. We have a question up to any questions. Um, we've got a question. Uh, so the first one I'll read out Is the canyon portage a must, or can it be carefully run in tandem canoes with spray skirts? Uh, it's I read somewhere that there's one whitewater kayaker who has run it. But uh, it starts with a six foot, two meter waterfall. So you would somehow have to down climb that. Mm. I think the stuff below might be runnable, or at least there's one person in life that has run it. Yeah, if I, if I could just get 2013, 
the advice that we were given by the outfitter was that the portage on the right shore, which is the, the high shore, and um, you can get back in um, a couple of kilometers down, I understand, and you can run it from there on. Um, we didn't do that. <laughs> we chose the left shore, and not my choice, but we chose the left shore because it looks shorter because you're going in that arc, right? So it looks like you're going across the arc. But in fact, yeah. that's so that, that you um, mean left shore looking down river, correct? Pardon me? When you say left shore, you mean when looking down river? Yes, uh, yeah, that's the way I uh, uh, do the convention. So you're looking yeah. down for river right, river left, right? So on yeah. your left, the, the river curves that way, right? So river left, it looks like the shorter route on map, but in fact, it's much more difficult with boggy alder swamps, uh, black uh, black spruce swamps, um, uh, you know, uh, muskeg up to your knees, it's it's horrendous. Um, so the better, uh, the guys that I with decided they knew better than the outfitter and decided that they would do the left shore and not the right shore, and that was really, um, uh, it wasn't wasn't good. It was a, it was yeah. a very long day, and uh, you know, we got to the campsite sometime in the evening um, after about uh, you know. 15 hours of, of, of walking back and forth with the three loads. So it's the worst portage I have ever done in my life. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we, we were on the right side also. Uh... Uh, we have another question. Um, but, but I, uh, could sorry, go ahead, twice. Bill. I just, having gone through there twice, it's entirely water level dependent. Um, a group came through there a year before we went and managed to line down the left shore. Um, and the route that they lined was six feet underwater when we came there a couple of years later. And we portaged along the left shore and I would echo that that's not the best way to do it. Go go on the right shore. It's longer, but it's much more pleasant. I wonder if on the right shore, should we have just gone 200 yards further inland? Uh, did we somehow miss it? Or was this still relatively good to what you compare about the left shore? Is there a clear sign of the trail? We did not see it. Um, the next question we have is how many hours a day were you paddling? Six to eight. I had a question for Kurt regarding food. Um, you know, these two trips were done about 17 years apart. So I'd be interested in your perspective and the second with an outfitter. Of yeah. um, your perspectives on the food with the two of you and what you had on the second trip, which I know we'll learn some more about next week. Uh, so, for the first trip, uh, Will and I had agreed on we both would be totally on our own for breakfast and lunch, and we would alternate cooking dinner for both. Well, thank you for all the excellent stuff that you cook. And in hindsight, I feel embarrassed. I had brought these <laughs> dehydrated mountain house pa food packages, which after a day of paddling when you're hungry, I find them pretty good, but by far not, can't compete with uh, the magic camp food that Will was able to cook with the whole spice collection and stuff that he had brought. But still it was relatively simple cooking. If you're going on a group trip, uh, the outfitters compete with each other who feeds you better. <laughs> and to bring some extra cooking equipment for two is a lot of extra work. For 10 or 12, it's not that big a deal. So we had cinnamon buns cooked in a Dutch oven on a campfire one of those days. Uh, they feed us really well. <laughs> 
on these uh, guided trips. I was interested I know too, next time. If I may ask another question, uh, Kurt. Um, years back, my daughter and I took a trip in Alaska in the Brooks Range through the gates of the Arctic. We were out for about two weeks. Uh, the first nine, 10 days were on foot from the headwaters of the North Fork of the Koyukuk down to a part where we could get a canoe, the outfit had stashed, and then back to Bettles. Um, one of the things I noticed, we ate a lot of freeze dyes and foods for main meals. And when we got back to the end of the trip, the cuticles around my nails were really dry and cracked. It was painful to use my hands. They hadn't been immersed tremendously in a lot of water because they only been paddling the last few days. I wonder if any of you had experienced that same thing. I don't know whether it's the food or the air or the back of the nails. Um, I, I had the same thing, these skin cracks sort of at the edge of the fingernails. Um, I had give, always given that on repeatedly getting wet, uh, maybe not getting as well washed as you would at home. I usually don't bring skin cream or stuff like that. I should, but usually forget that. Um, I hadn't seen the connection to the dehydrated food. Maybe there is one, but yes, that is the, the one health problem or pain problem that I had on both felon trips and many of my other trips as well. I usually, I rarely paddle with gloves. Normally don't, don't easily get blisters. So I, I wore gloves on that trip only when the bugs were that bad that I wanted to have keep them off my hands. All right, we've got one request that it'd be nice to have the trip without bugs. <laughs> so the, the second trip, we started uh, June, I believe 27th, we flew out onto the river. There was still a good amount of ice on some of the bigger lakes. The river, the Clark was ice free. We did not have any, any bugs the first three or four days. But that's, that's a narrow window between ice breakup. Uh, and then you have a few days before the bugs come out. Congratulations if you can time it right. Uh, Kurt, I have a question. I'm curious, you, uh, you flew in with two flights, but you made it out with just one. Did you, were you confident because of the food you had consumed, you could shoehorn everything into the plane for the way out? Uh, we were hoping so. Uh, when the pilot got there, we talked about it for quite a while. Do we need to leave the garbage behind? We wouldn't want to, but do we need to leave the one and a half day worth of food or one day worth of food that we had left behind? We wouldn't want to leave garbage behind, but we talked about it. In the end, the pilot said, you know what, this doesn't make any difference anyway. Uh, I'm pretty sure that I remember the pilot saying, we probably were above the legal limit, but he managed to get the plane into the air. Must have been a relief. <laughs> oh. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I would have been interesting to again split up and one of us is flying back and the plane has to come back again. <laughs> I think we would have rather left gear behind and told him fly the gear out afterwards. <laughs> yeah, at that point I was <laughs> late to get back to work. I had already used up all my vacation days for the year. <laughs> but it was worth it. So you ended up not making the connection flights on the way home? No, I had the surprisingly pleasant experience and I love Air Canada. Walk up to the counter in Yellowknife on August 3rd or 4th with a ticket that would have gone from Baker Lake to Montreal to Connecticut. So I'm not only at the wrong airport, 
okay, it's a hundred dollar uh, rebooking fee, but they gave me full credit for the price of the other ticket. <laughs> But yeah, it worked out fine for Will, who had his, he actually had dr driven from his car from Alaska to Yellowknife. That way he got back to Yellowknife without having to fly Baker Lake to somewhere south to Yellowknife. But for me, it ended up uh, adding a little bit of a logistical challenge to come home afterwards. Yeah. Yeah, weather is always an issue, it delays everything. <laughs> 